Hey, my lovelies, it's Miss Garcia. Um, unfortunately, I found out that I have a training this morning, so today's lesson will be a recording, uh, which makes me a little sad because I was kind of excited to teach it to you guys. But we will go over it a little bit more tomorrow um, during your work day. But uh, let's get started. So for today's daily objectives, we're going to continue on with fiction, specifically to continue building knowledge of fiction, specifically the element of setting to demonstrate reflective thinking based on visual media, and to make predictions based on newly acquired knowledge. All right, so what does that mean? That means that today, um, I'm just gonna give you a quick, quick recap of the fiction time periods and isms. Um, we're gonna go on to the elements of fiction, specifically setting, and then you'll have time to do some independent reading, the things they carried by Tim O'Brien. I would like you to have um, at least halfway done um, the reading by, mm, Thursday. So you will have some time tomorrow to also read on those things. All right. So let's move on. So remember that we're going to be dealing in the postmodern era and era and the postmodern era deals with realism, which basically is truthful facts, you know, specific history uh, and not really looking for fantasy or trying to sugarcoat anything. It also takes into account that people are flawed, so good people can still make bad decisions. Um, and postmodern also tries very hard to use imagery, and they also have unreliable narrators. So every once in a while, you are going to be like, hmm, can I believe what the narrator is saying? Uh, or, you know, is, should I be suspect about what he's saying? Uh, also, remember that it does not follow traditional conventions in regards to storytelling. So sometimes the story will jump around. Um, there's going to be some flashbacks, some memories, some thinking, things like that, that will kind of keep you on your toes. So let's go ahead and jump into the element of fiction. Uh, so elements of fiction, which is particular today's setting. And again, this is a quick recording, so it's not going to be perfect. So if I stumble over my words or I make some mistakes, I'm human. So please just uh, keep that in mind. So the elements of fiction, setting. One key element of fiction, of any fiction, is setting. But what exactly is the setting? According to LiteraryDevices.com, the setting is the time and place, or when and where, of the story. So why is that even important? Well, the setting actually gives context to how characters are acting and helps the story make sense. So when a character is acting a certain way, you need to look at the time and place in which they're, they are, and that will influence how they're, they're acting. So, for example, you act very different with your friends, you know, when you're out versus maybe, let's say, when you're at home with your parents. That setting of your house changes how you act, and it helps us make sense of why you're acting that way. So some characteristics of setting are, it's normally introduced at the beginning of a work um, most of the time. It establishes, it's established through imagery, so there's a lot of descriptive words kind of trying to paint that picture for you. It can cover uh, time and place. So sometimes you'll know just the time, sometimes you'll know the place, sometimes you'll know both. It includes physical locations as well as its climate and weather, and sometimes those are key indicators, right? Um, it makes a big deal if somebody is wearing shorts and they say they're from, let's say, Corpus Christi, South Texas, where it's really hot, versus if somebody is wearing shorts and he's in northern United States where it's like minus 20 degrees. You go from being appropriate attire to this person must be crazy because it's cold outside. So that can definitely make a difference on how you view a character and a story. It also establishes the cultural and social environment of the work. That can be very important as well. Um, based on the culture that is taking place in that story can change how maybe that character views the world or how they interact with the world. Also, the social environment um, can definitely change how a story takes place. If the story takes place in a very poor neighborhood versus a very rich neighborhood, that changes how those characters act. And it also changed maybe the background that we're looking at for that character. And also know that setting is not stagnant. It's not still. It can change throughout the story. So we can go through many different time periods or many different places. 
There are two types of setting. The first is considered a backdrop setting. And just think of it basically like it says, it's a backdrop that is not meant to really be paid attention to as much because it's not as important. So backdrop setting, um, the story is timeless and can happen at any point in time or place. So I can take that story and I can put it in 4th century BC China and it still makes sense. Or I can take that story and I can put it now and it makes sense. Because the focus is on the message instead of the actual setting. The setting is not as important to the story as the actual message. So keep that in mind. One of the famous examples of backdrop setting is Winnie the Pooh. Um, I don't know about you, but I watched Winnie the Pooh when, when I was young. My children have watched it and read it. But you never know exactly when it's taking place. Um, we kind of have an, a where, but even that where is kind of iffy. Does it exist in England? Is it in the United States? Like, where is it? But it's not as important because the reader or the viewer doesn't need to know where the story is taking place to still get the lessons to be understood. Those lessons of friendship and responsibility and kindness, those are universal and can be taken and put anywhere in the world. The second type is integral setting. And just like the term integral, that means, which is important, crucial, the time and place of the story are critical to the overall storyline and the plot. So a good example of this is Ready Player One. <clears throat> I'm not sure if many of you have seen it, but that's very important for both the book and the movie because it serves as a good example that if you try to take that story about a boy, you know, winning a competition in a virtual world to kind of take down the man with technology, well, that doesn't quite fit if I put that in like the 50s or 4th century, 4th century BC China. That story is not going to make sense because they didn't have that technology at that time. And granted, the technology that we see in Ready Player One is not technology that we necessarily have right now, but it's close enough to the technology or the possibilities of technology for it to still make sense. So the fact that the story takes place in the future and is centered around a virtual world called the Oasis is a key point to the entire story. You take out that virtual world from this story and it does not make sense. So without the setting, the story would be completely different. So that's why it's integral, it's important, it has to be there. So now that we have an understanding of the setting, let's put it all into context of what we're gonna be reading. So the first book that we're reading is called The Things They Carried by Tim O'Brien. It's a really good book. I hope you really like it. I pulled three chapters from it. The book takes place during the Vietnam War, uh, which was well before you guys were born and a little bit before I was born. Um, and so therefore, I do need to provide you guys some background because it's not something that you guys have learned a lot about. I learned a little bit more about it because it was still very close to my my growing up um, time frame. However, it's not that close to y'all's, so we do need to get you some information. So first and foremost, um, there's some dates. So the Vietnam War started November 1st, 1955, and went through April 30th, 1975. Like I said, it's a little bit before I was born. I was born in 1978, so it was over by the time I was born. But that's a significant time frame. However, the things they carried focuses more on the end part of it, the tail of it. And it's from 1969 to 1971, roughly. We never get an actual timestamp. We just know it's towards the end because it's when there's the draft and everything is kind of coming to a head. It's not getting any better. The soldiers are finally getting more disgruntled um, and there's just a lot of issues going on. So there is a quick history lesson, so let's take a look at it. Vietnam was part of French Indochina, a French colony in Southeast Asia established in 1887 for the French to reinforce Catholic missionaries. Indochina was controlled by France up until World War II, when France was invaded by Nazi Germany and Japan invaded Indochina. The Japanese ruled through the former French protectorate emperor, Bao Dai, as a puppet. Ho Chi Minh was the leader of the Viet Minh, a communist army who rose up against the Japanese occupiers. 
after the Japanese defeat in 1945, the Viet Minh declared Vietnamese independence with the Democratic Republic of Vietnam and Hanoi as its capital, and extended their war against the French, becoming the first Indochina war. During this time, the Cold War was setting in, and the USA were backing anti-communist regimes, while the Soviet Union and People's Republic of China were backing pro-communist regimes. The Korean War was a fine example of this. Thus, lay China and the Soviet Union back the Viet Minh, and the USA and Britain backed the French in the South. The state of Vietnam was established with Emperor Bao Dai as the leader in an anti-communist regime. American military advisors had been helping the French, but President Eisenhower was reluctant to put US troops on the ground. The Viet Minh ultimately were victorious, and it was decided in the Geneva Accords that Vietnam be divided into the state of Vietnam and the Democratic Republic of Vietnam. Cambodia and Laos were also granted independence, ending French Indochina. Ngo Dinh Diem became the Prime Minister in the South. As South Vietnam prepared for a referendum on reuniting North and South, many Northern Vietnamese Catholics fled South, while many Viet Minh went North to plan ahead. The North Vietnam regime sought to take power away from the landlords and distribute the wealth among the peasants. Many people were executed and wrongly imprisoned. The referendum was held, but many were skeptical about its fairness. Diem rigged the vote, winning a ridiculously massive majority in keeping the South separate. Diem declared the South independent and became the Republic of Vietnam, with Saigon as its capital. Thus, Vietnam would move into the Second Indochina War, or simply known in the West as the Vietnam War. The US looked on in fear, believing that communism would spread like dominoes, and if Vietnam fell, it would threaten India, Japan, and other nations in that region. Diem set about quelling any communist actions in the South, arresting and executing many people. He was a Roman Catholic, which was often at odds with the predominantly Buddhist population. In 1960, communist forces and other anti-government groups in the South were organized into the National Liberation Front, or the Viet Cong, as they were branded by the South. North Vietnam support came via the Ho Chi Minh Trail, a border hopping trail connecting North and South via Laos and Cambodia. Support for the NLF was strongest in the countryside, which was being crushed by extreme rent and landlord reforms by the South government. The government, under US advisement and funding, tried to relocate many rural peasants into strategic hamlets to keep them away from the influence of the NLF insurgents, but the program was a failure and actually ended up strengthening the NLF. New US President John F. Kennedy faced many embarrassments with the spread of communism, such as the Bay of Pigs disaster, the construction of the Berlin Wall, and the growth of communist power in Laos. He believed Vietnam was where he could make a strong stand against the spread of communism. Kennedy was reluctant to put US troops on the ground, believing that the South Vietnam Army had to defeat the NLF on their own, but they were disorganized, crippled by political corruption, and under constant attack from guerrilla forces. More and more US military advisors and equipment were sent to Vietnam to help. But despite this, the South Vietnam Army continued to suffer silly defeats at the hands of the NLF. By 1963, religious tensions ran high as the pro-Catholic government discriminated more and more against Buddhists, banning their flag, killing protesters, and raiding the voters. Protests intensified. On November 1st, officers of the South Vietnam Army rose up against the government and captured the leaders in a coup d'etat. Ngo Dinh Diem and his brother and advisor Ngo Dinh Nu were brutally assassinated the following day. The NLF took advantage of the political chaos of the South and strengthened their position with the people. To add even more instability, John F. Kennedy was assassinated in Dallas, Texas, less than a month after the coup. Lyndon B. Johnson became the new U.S. president and things changed. After some more coups, General Nguyen Tan became head of the South Vietnamese Military Council. The CIA had been training South Vietnamese forces and sending Vietnamese commandos on raids in the north. On August 2, 1964, the U.S. Navy ship, the USS Maddox, was monitoring signals coming from North Vietnam in the Gulf of Tonkin. It fired three warning shots at some North Vietnam torpedo boats who opened fire with torpedoes and machine guns. The skirmish resulted in four Vietnamese casualties and no U.S. casualties. Two days later, a similar incident was reported from the Maddox, but it would later turn out to be false. But not before these incidents were used by President Johnson to order an airstrike and get Congress to push through the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, which allowed him to escalate the United States' involvement in Vietnam without an actual declaration of war. Johnson ensured U.S. people that he would not be sending American boys over to Vietnam before he was re-elected. Conscription in the United States, known as the draft, had been on the go constantly since 1940, till gaps in the army were volunteered for his joining. As tensions in Vietnam escalated, many young men tried to avoid the draft, which could be a criminal offence. Come 1965, the NLF and North Vietnam forces continued their victories against the South. In February, while new Soviet Premier Alexei Kosygin was on a state visit to strengthen ties with North Vietnam, 
the MLF attacked a U.S. helicopter facility in Fleet Hoot. In retaliation, Johnson ordered bombing campaigns over North Vietnam. It was also decided that the South Vietnam Army weren't enough to guard the U.S. air bases. So, on the 8th of March, the first U.S. ground troops were sent to South Vietnam in the form of 3,500 Marines. Neighboring Laos fell into civil war between the U.S.-backed government and the communist Ape Lao. U.S. Operation Barrel Roll saw the aerial bombardment of the Ape Lao, trying to deny Vietnam access to the Ho Chi Minh Trail. But this was thwarted. One particular bomb, which was used by the U.S. throughout the war, was napalm, a sticky flammable chemical which was very effective at destroying jungle and causing mass devastation and terror. By the end of 1965, U.S. ground forces had swollen to 200,000 troops, still with the view of defending South Vietnam, but troop morale was low. This defensive position was soon to change, however, as General William Westmoreland believed that U.S. troops could end this war if they went on the offensive. A three-point plan was made with a view to winning the war. Johnson approved and the war escalated. South Vietnamese Air Marshal Nguyen Cao Phi became Prime Minister in mid-1965, bringing a little political stability to the South. The U.S. called its CETO allies to contribute troops to the conflict, which they did, as did South Korea. Despite the change of focus to go on the offensive, the harsh conditions and lack of progress, President Johnson and the U.S. government reassured the public that everything was going as planned. Amidst the war, the United Front for the Liberation of Oppressed Races rose up to oppose both North and South and defend minorities in the central highlands of Vietnam. In December 1966, Ho Chi Minh said of the Americans, If they want to make war for 20 years, then we shall make war for 20 years. If they want to make peace, we shall make peace and invite them to tea afterwards. It was a hard and grueling war of attrition, in which the U.S. had the technological advantage, but the MLF and North Vietnam had the knowledge of the land and the support of many of the people. Underground tunnel networks were used by the MLF to secretly move around the countryside near Saigon, surprising U.S. troops seemingly out of nowhere. Nguyen Van Thiel became president of South Vietnam in 1967 and would remain until 1975. On January 30, 1968, the Vietnamese New Year known as Tet, the NLF and the North Vietnamese launched a massive offensive across the South, taking everyone by surprise. The Tet Offensive saw 85,000 troops attacking over 100 cities, including the U.S. Embassy in Saigon. Despite being caught unawares, the U.S. and South Vietnamese counterattack was powerful and effective. The city of Hue, the former capital which lay near the border of North and South, was fiercely fought over. While occupying the city, NLF and North Vietnam forces brutally executed over 3,000 people. After a month of fighting, the city was retaken by the U.S. and the South, but there was little left of the city standing. It was one of the bloodiest battles of the war. Media coverage of journalists on the ground in Vietnam differed from the official line coming from President Johnson, which damaged his credibility. The U.S. people's approval of Johnson and the war plummeted. The conduct of some U.S. forces was also very controversial. The My Lai Massacre in March 1968 saw between 347 and 504 unarmed men, women and children massacred by U.S. troops in Son Mai. This story didn't emerge to the public until November 1969. Peace talks between U.S. and North Vietnam began in Paris in May 1968, which resulted in the stopping of bombing on North Vietnam. After a presidential campaign with many twists and turns, Richard Nixon was elected President of the United States. When Nixon came into office, the war was very unpopular and looking more and more unwinnable. Nixon began to withdraw troops from Vietnam in 1969 with a view of replacing them with South Vietnam forces. Ho Chi Minh died at the age of 79 in September 1969. Some ministers and military leaders formed a portico for collective leadership to see an end of the war. Unbeknownst to the public until 2000, Nixon actually sent a squadron of nuclear-armed B-52 bombers to the Soviet border in October in the hope that they'd believe he was mad enough to win the war in Vietnam at any cost. The U.S. bombed NLF and North Vietnamese camps in neighboring Cambodia. North Vietnam invaded Cambodia in support of the Cambodian communist movement Khmer Rouge, so U.S. and South Vietnam in turn invaded Cambodia. This escalation angered many. Nationwide protests in America sprang up and four students were killed by National Guardsmen in Ohio. The South Vietnam Army invaded Laos, looking to cut off the Ho Chi Minh Trail, but it was a complete disaster. More controversies about the war became publicly known, including the Pentagon Papers revealing top-secret documents which were leaked to the New York Times. Nixon tried to block their publishing, but the Supreme Court ruled in favor of the papers. Nixon did begin to open talks with the Soviet Union and China, possibly to isolate North Vietnam from its communist allies. The Easter Offensive saw a new invasion from the NLF and North Vietnam in 1972. This resulted in the U.S. recommencing the bombing of North Vietnam, which stopped the North Offensive. Eventually, after Hanoi and Haiphong were heavily bombed at the end of 1970, 
1972, North and South came to the negotiating table with the US. Around this time, Lyndon Johnson died of heart disease in Texas. In January 1973, Nixon suspended any attacks on North Vietnam, ended the draft, and the Paris Accords were signed, ending the United States' involvement in the Vietnam War. All US ground troops were withdrawn by March. U.S. Secretary of State Henry Kissinger and North Vietnam Foreign Minister Le Duc Tho were awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, but Tho refused, as true peace didn't exist yet in Vietnam, and rightly was. The South's economy felt the vacuum left by the U.S. Army and spiking oil prices due to the trouble in the Middle East hit the South hard. In January 1974, the North used the dry season to retake much lost land from the South while the United States was embroiled in the Watergate scandal and Nixon claimed resignation. Seeing the limited response from the South, the North pressed their advantage in 1975. Poor and confused leadership from Southern presidents led to massive gains by the North, capturing Da Nang and many other cities. A stream of retreating Southern forces and refugees headed for the coast. With the momentum built, the North moved to capture Saigon before the monsoon season. A desperate evacuation began of many U.S. Marines and foreign diplomats by helicopter as Vietnam civilians trying desperately to escape were abandoned. On the 30th of April 1975, North Vietnam forces entered Saigon, raising the NLF flag, and the Vietnam War came to an end. In 1976, North and South would be unified into the Socialist Republic of Vietnam, and Saigon was renamed Ho Chi Minh. All right. So as you can see, um, as you can see, the Vietnam War went on for a very long time, and uh, in the end, it was united into one country. So that begs the question. Was it worth it? And was it worth the loss of lives of American soldiers? So now what I want you to do is look at these images and pay close attention to the content within them. Then reflect on the images above and go ahead and, and put your information or how you feel um, within this uh, Padlet right here. Then you're going to go ahead and watch this video. It is a CBS Evening News uh, broadcast. It is a little graphic, so keep that in mind. And then again, put your thoughts here. Um, let us know what you think about it, but make sure you put your first and last name. And then finally, I do want you to make a prediction. You'll click on this link here. It'll take you uh, to make a prediction if you think that the Vietnam War is going to be a backdrop setting, or is it really gonna be an integral part of the book that we're reading? Once you've completed that, make sure you have those done. You do need to go ahead and take your quiz, um, which is located in your Tuesday folder. It's very short. Just make sure you take it. You can use your notes. And then go ahead and start reading the things they carried. Again, I would like at least half of it read by Thursday. You will also have time to read it tomorrow. If you have any questions, just let me know, and I'll miss you guys. Bye.